Hi there, everyone. Welcome to and welcome back to our 2023 uh, free webinar series. We're very fortunate to kick it off this year with uh, Dr. Damien Tiao. I'll go I'll give you a little bit of a bio for those who don't know him, although I'm sure many of you already do. Um, my name's Alex. I'll be the host for today. Um, this series, we've got a few webinars planned and we've got kind of updated as we go. So those who've already registered, you'll be registered for the full series. Um, but I'll be also be joining with Dr. Emmanuel. Emmanuel is based in Sydney. He's a great dentist who will also be helping host uh, some of the webinars we have today. This series is all about taking topics and trying to find and you know create a, a small bite-sized piece. Um, today, for example, we're going to be talking about you know sleep and airway, and this is a huge topic. And Damien's got a full mini residency on this. So in 30 minutes, there's going to be a you know a covering of some key objectives and maybe some you know some interesting and salient points that we can apply into daily practice. Um, and hopefully we can expand on that with some questions that come on later today. Um, for those who aren't aware, um, in the background as well, we're hosting uh, in Melbourne our next study club. Um, I'll put in some details in the comments as well and kind of showing a little flyer in a moment. Um, but back to Damien. Damien's a dentist. He graduated from La Trobe in 2012, and he's dived into TMD and sleep medicine kind of ever since. And he's had a whole journey and pathway of having essentially and now um, – has his practice essentially solely focused in these areas. So treating patients with craniofacial pain, headaches, neck pain, um, those who have breathing issues, sleep issues. Um, and as I mentioned, he's kind of gone through education of his own and different residency programs of his own, um, but he's also teaching and educating in this space. And it's a space that's, I think, TMD and sleep. You know, as dentists, we sometimes forget and we focus on uh, procedures and we focus on surgery and sometimes we forget that at, you know the first thing that we are is doctors and physicians and trying to and I say that with my bias being in periodontal medicine and periodontal disease and chronic conditions of that nature as well and so there's I think it's really important to understand that you know diseases are symptoms of a patient's predisposed risk factors and you know treating the whole patient is a really important key factor to not just getting a great result um, immediately or shortly, but, you know, the long-term maintenance and the long-term impact. Um, so without further ado, I welcome Damien and, um, you know, excited for a great presentation. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Alex. All right. Well, um, thank you all for attending tonight um, and let's dive straight into it. So I'm going to be talking about um 40 ish minutes maybe 45 um and then we'll um, field things with a few questions uh, i tried to keep it as short as i can but it's this is such an amazing topic and um as alex said um it's something i'm really passionate about because i've been doing this for the last 10 years and um i'll just skim through this because alex will cover it, but i work i don't work in dental clinics anymore i work in a sleep clinic and um, a tmj osteophysiotherapy clinic um, so, um, and I've been working with these um, different clinics for the last five, four or five years now. Uh, so this is basically my room in the, um, in the Caulfield Center in the physio clinic and my room in, um, <clears throat> in um, the Lung and Sleep Victoria and the sleep clinic is very similar as well. I don't use a dental chair. Um, it's all just a bed and I have a little drill, disposable mirrors, etc. Um, to work with splints. And the reality, the reason why I love showing this slide to people is it makes them understand that what we're looking at with TMD and sleep and bruxism especially is we're looking at humans and we're looking at people with medical health conditions. And there's definitely dental implications and things we can do as dentists to help them um, and treat them. But at the same time, dentistry is a very special is sometimes a small component of some of these patients. And it's something we're not exposed to a lot, um, especially in the dental world. It, um, won't name any unis or anything, but a very certain state uni, I had I met up with a few um, first year students at a postgrad at one of our state unis, and they said they're not being taught anything about this or about sleep medicine or just 
airways and bruxism and they were asking some of their lectures about lecturers about bruxism and relationship with sleep apnea and they they were dismissed about it. the lecturers were like no don't talk about it. we don't need to worry about that and it's like look, these are um things that are really important to us and have been known in the sleep field since the early 2000s so it's something that we really just need to <clears throat> um, be more aware of especially since us as dentists are becoming more prominent in the treatment so Let's first go into what are sleep brain disorders and why it's very important to us in dentistry. So one of the main reasons it's very important to us is from this man, Dr. Christian Guimanol. Now, Guimanol is considered the father of sleep apnea, and he discovered upper airway resistance syndrome in the 1980s. And he sadly passed away a few years ago, but his research, especially in his um, dying years, was um, focusing predominantly on craniofacial growth, such as orthodontics, um, dentistry and uh, how to use orthodontics and dentistry to treat sleep apnea and my functional exercises which are sleep and uh, which are tongue and lip exercises to strengthen the muscles and you can see his lecturing about orthodontics in this lecture of his and this is a neurologist and psychiatrist so not, not a dentist but he's teaching about dentistry to other doctors so it's a very powerful message if the um father of sleep apnea is saying that dentists have such an important role in this field and he's he's been invited to dental conferences around the world um this was 2019 at an orthodontic conference he what he said establishing 100 percent nasal breathing is the essential endpoint in eliminating osa very powerful statement and that's something i look for with all of my, my patients as well whether they can breathe through their nose so um, in one of his researches from 1990s, so almost 30 years ago, um, he was looking at a predictive model for what could call, uh, put people at a high risk for sleep apnea. And he found these six different points we should look at, the neck circumference, the body mass index, powder height, maxillary and mandible um, width, um, and the overjet. And you can see these last four um, of these six points, they're very dental related things. These are things we see on a daily basis. Uh, so he summarizes the formula saying that anyone with a high palate, narrow dental arches or overjets have a high risk of sleep apnea. And these are things that, you know, GPs, doctors, the general public won't look at or know. And these are things we see all the time. And we just see them as, you know, orthodontic problems, but they're not orthodontic problems. I always think, yes, maybe they have orthodontic problems, but could it also be a breathing problem. So... Sleep disorder breathing, SDB, is an umbrella term incorporating snoring, upper airway resistance syndrome, or UARS, and obstructive sleep apnea. Now, a big mistake lots of doctors and dentists make is they, um, they separate these three entities, and they think they're three separate um, conditions. But the reality is they're not three separate conditions. They're, um, oh, hang on. Uh, let's see. I don't know if there's a way to... Oh, that's all right. Yeah. Sorry, Alex. Uh, it's just uh, this. Um, it's got the animations where this will come. Oh, up. yeah. Um, let's see what we can do. Um, if you'd like, we can um, try it when you. I'll remove this. Try just presenting your screen and share screen. Yep. And we can try that. That's fine with me. Yep. I can do that. So let me just get my PowerPoint to the correct slide. There we go. And yeah, I'll just. Perfect. All right. Can they see, see my screen? Yep. Perfect. All right. All right. Cool. So, uh, yeah. So, with sleep, sleep disorder breathing, it's a spectrum. So, anyone who snores will eventually start um, having UARS, and then they'll eventually start having sleep apnea, whether it be mild, moderate, or severe. And that's the big mistake lots of our doctors make. They're all focusing most purely on the sleep apnea part. They just think, oh, we just need to focus up here. Don't need to worry about snoring. So that's why lots of patients, they'll see a GP and they'll tell them they're snoring. 
by the GP who say, oh, you don't need to do anything about it at the moment. And it's, you know, it's not really taking good care of our patients because um, it's the same as if we have periodontitis. Uh, we don't want to, the minute we see patients with a white spot lesion or the smallest bit of plaque, we're on top of them to clean their teeth better. We don't wait for them to have advanced, advanced perio with abscesses and teeth falling out to start treating them. We treat them straight away. And that's something I see on a regular basis. I'll see patients who've been diagnosed with mild sleep apnea, and the doctor tells them, you don't need to do any treatment. Let's wait until you get worse, and then we'll do treatment. Because they're just thinking about um, the, using CPAP. When CPAP is sometimes too, um, too uh, intense for patients to use a mild sleep apnea or in snoring, and some of these patients, they could be snoring and feeling crap all the time, wake up unrefreshed, maybe even having high blood pressure from their snoring. But the GPs or doctors will refuse to treat them because they're not bad enough for CPAP. And that's where we can come in with dentistry to use splints um, and appliances to help open the airway, help them breathe better. So with sleep apnea, especially with OSA, with obstructive sleep apnea, it's basically from a blockage in the airway, whether it be from the nose or the throat, and the most common causes from the bottom jaw and tongue falling back and blocking the airway. And this is where we can come in using a mandibular advanced splints to bring this forward. So let's have a bit of a talk about what we should look for in our patients. So the medical history is the most important and simplest thing you can look at. If patients come in with like diabetes or high blood pressure or um, risk of um, you know, other um, health conditions linked with sleep apnea, such as like um, um, thyroid issues, hormone issues, um, obesity, et cetera, I'm always thinking, could they have sleep apnea? And then if they mention things like, oh, yeah, I snore at night, I feel tired. I'm just linking together that maybe this person needs to have a sleep study and we could do something to treat their snoring, but it might as well help with any of the other health conditions going on. So a very simple thing I do is in all my, um, all my questionnaires, I just ask simple questions for my patients to fill in. And if they tick things like, yes, I snore, I wake up gasping, I feel tired in the morning, that's really telling me, hey, well, maybe this person has sleep apnea. Maybe I should ask them a few more questions and investigate further. We've also got the stop bang. The stop bang is... A excuse me, is an acronym that we use to screen for sleep apnea in adults. Um, because this is the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, the ESS. This is something that we use to screen how tired someone can feel. Because if you ask someone, do you feel tired? Most of the time they'll say no. But these questions can help narrow it down and show that actually they are very tired during the day. And the reality is that snoring is not normal. Um, in kids, especially, it is not normal. So when we measure sleep apnea with sleep studies, we measure the number of times to stop breathing an hour. And for adults, anyone who gets five or above is mild, moderate, or severe. But you can see with kids, if they get one, they're already a mild sleep apnea patient. So anyone who snores, even kids, has, um, has some sort of breathing problem going on and it should be investigated. So the BMI plays a very big role with, um, with sleep apnea, as Gim and all shown in his study. And the research does show that gaining or losing weight can either worsen sleep apnea or sometimes even treat sleep apnea, especially in the big overweight um, kids and adults. Um, and weight reduction has shown, 10% uh, weight reduction does lead to a 26% reduction in the AHR and RDI. So the most important thing I look for in all my patients is something I call the big three. The big three is the lip seal, brain through the nose, and tongue on the roof of the mouth. The reason why these three things are so important is when we do all three of these things, it keeps our jaw relaxed, which helps with clenches and grinders. Um, but it also helps keep us our airway open and helps us breathe better. If we're mouth breathing, we're going to um, when we, we mouth breathe, we're not going to get enough oxygen for our, uh, into our airways. When we mouth breathe, it's just a very inflammatory, and mouth breathing will always cause snoring. The nose, when we breathe through the nose, we it's very hard to snore if you're breathing through the nose. But with the mouth, it will it has a much e it's much easier to snore because you start um, vibrating the soft palate and the um, the soft tissues at the back of the throat. Whereas when you breathe through the nose, um, ENTs have shown that it's much it's physically harder and Im almost impossible to snore when you're. Um, breathing through your nose, unless there's something blocking the nose. So the nose is for breathing, the mouth is for eating and, and talking. I told this to all my patients, if you're breathing through your mouth, you're going to have to learn how to eat and talk through your nose. 
And this is a, um, a study from um, Dr. Audrey Yoon, a pediatric orthodontist who's very passionate about sleep medicine from the United States. And she studied with, she um, did lots of research with Professor Gimenol and ENT Sarush Zaghi. They created this um, scale called the Ferris scale to use in kids to look for signs and symptoms of sleep apnea. Um, and we'll be going through a few of these in, um, in this uh, lecture. So the first most important thing is mouth breathing. If we're seeing kids or adults who are mouth breathing, there must be something going on. And most of the time, it's an obstruction. But it may not be an obstruction. The nose and airways might be clear, but there might be a habitual mouth breather. And the reason why mouth breathing is so important uh, is uh, nose breathing is so important, especially in kids, is nose breathing is going to encourage proper orthodontic growth. So the tongue is the natural body expander of the mouth. So the tongue exerts about 500 grams of force. And if our mouth is closed and the tongue is on the roof of the mouth, it's going to grow and expand that palate. Whereas if the mouth is open, the tongue is not on the palate, the cheeks and buccinator masseters, they'll push inwards and make the mouth smaller. And that's why we see orthodontic crowding issues in our patients. This is where things like our breastfeeding, bottle feeding come into play as well. So breastfeeding is really important because that's basically encouraging my functional exercises. When we breastfeed, we have to push the tongue onto the roof of the mouth and push the nipple against the palate to help grow and encourage the palate to grow. Um, and you can see here by using the palate, um, by using the tongue and the, pushing the nipple up, it encourages the tongue and mandible to grow and come forward. Whereas when, oh, and with a tongue, you can see uh, with um, breastfeeding, it pushes the nipple and compresses it to help grow and then widen and expand the palate. Whereas when we use bottles or pacifiers, it, we don't get that, that same effect. A pa um, the dummy or, pa or bottle is rubber, so we can't push it against the palate as much. And it tends to push the mandible and tongue backwards, which can block the airway even more. You can see if it's a pacify or a bottle, it's just the same as thumb sucking. It's not going to mold against the palate, and we're not going to get that proper ma uh, maxillary development if we're using something different. And this is where I think other issues, uh, my functional tongue issues, such as the tongue tie, comes into play. So it's ve a very big problem, especially for newborn infants. Newborn babies at two years old can have sleep apnea because their tongue is tied. If its tongue is tied, um, they're not going to be able to breastfeed properly. They're going to become colic. But also more importantly, they're not going to get that palatal development. So if we see kids at like five, six years old with a first dental appointment, and they've got a tongue tie, most of the time they'll probably have a very narrow palate, maybe a, um, a class two overjet and possibly even breathing sleeping problems. So this goes back to what I was mentioned before. When we see malocclusions, are they just a malocclusion or is it also a sign of potentially a breathing problem? So this is one of my patients, an adult, 30 years old, open bite his whole life, but he's been snoring his whole life. And the snoring doesn't bother him. It just bothers his um, partner. And you can see open bite. People, dentists will have seen his open bite for many, many years, I'm assuming. But no one's ever thought, why does he ever open bite? And it's only when I start looking down his throat, we can see his tonsils are blocking his throat. And if his tonsils are blocking his throat, he's going to um, have sleep apnea and start snoring. What will also happen if he can't breathe and is choking at night, the tongue will thrust forward. And when it's thrusting forward, it's going to push these teeth apart and cause that open bite. You can see the scalloping of the tongue, these little ridges of indentation. That's a sign of the tongue thrusting because when the tongue thrusts, it pushes against these teeth to leave these scallop marks. So it's a clear sign. This is a 30-year-old male who's had an open bite his whole life, snoring his whole life, but no one's ever bothered to ask or look down his throat just a bit further to see these tonsils. If it's another one of my patients, another, you can see another open bite, tongue thrusting, crossbite, um, and she was having um, snoring sleep apnea as well. And she's, she's not a young person. She's in her mid-20s, 30s. So these are issues which people, which they have seen, been seeing dentists for many years, and they just think, oh, it's just a malocclusion. She doesn't want to do braces. We'll just leave it. But they're not thinking about the bigger picture of could this potentially be a sleep apnea or breathing problem that's causing this malocclusion. And the most common classic one we'll always see is an overbite or deep bite. An overbite or deep bite always has a high chance of causing sleep apnea because obviously you can see the mandible is just going to be pushing back and blocking the airway and making it hard to breathe. And that's basically what we're looking at when we're using mandibular advancement splint, we're looking at pushing that mandible forward to open that airway. And this is one of my patients, um, she had a 12 millimeter overjet and missing teeth, which didn't help as well. 
I can see her oropharyngeal airway is 2.76 millimeters at the um, at the smallest point. So that's so tiny. You can just imagine. Um, she's it, this is a much older woman as well in her like 60s. She's had an airway and overbite like this since she was a kid. So it's no wonder she was having sleep apnea. And this is another one of my patients where um, big overjet, and you can see we're using a different mandibular advanced splint here to just push and hold the airway open to help her breathe better as well as protect her teeth from clenching and grinding. So we've got four main points of obstruction in our airway. We've got the front of the nose at the nasal valve. We've got the turbinates inside the nose, the soft palate, and then at the base of the tongue. And we cover obstruction in any four or all or a combination of these four areas, which can then cause us to choke and have sleep apnea. And this is just an example showing why that morphology of our palate and max maxilla is so important. If we've got very severely um, narrow maxilla, it's going to make the nose smaller because you can see this, this, this um, palatal tissue, it has to go somewhere and the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. So if it's all narrow and constricted, the nose is going to be narrow constricted and you're going to see more constricted um, um, co enlarged turbinates and deviated septums. So you can see this is a, a nice wide developed palate. And when you develop palate is wide and developed, the nasal um, airways are wide and developed. Whereas with a very narrow palate, you can see it's much smaller inside that nasal area. So they have shown research where one of Gimeno's research was looking into palatal expansion. And he found that by widening the palate, the, it can also correct deviated septums. And the reason why these septums are deviated is normally because the nose is too small to fit that septum in there properly. This is the same as our teeth. The teeth become crooked because the mouth is too small. The nose septum will come crooked because the nose is too small. And it was here, this is his research showing where when you expand it, you can see the deviate the septum's a bit deviated here. When they expanded, it got a bit straighter. There's another research from Peter Sestorli. Peter Sestorli is a sleep professor from Sydney University. And this is from 1998. A sleep physician is doing maxillary expansion for sleep apnea treatment from the 1990s. And he found that expanding the maxilla can improve nasal airway resist resistance by up to 37%. So those are huge numbers we're looking at here. This is um, Dr. Stanley Liu, who, uh, ENT MaxFax surgeon from Stanford, who has a study with Guimanol. He developed um, the dome expansion surgery, which is a very minimally invasive surgical procedure um, or palatal expansion procedure, which we can do for adults, especially since the maxilla becomes fused with that suture. So um, he and Dr. Won Moon, who's from um, Korea, developed a MMSC dome expander, which is using small tads inside the mouth to grow and expand it. This is Dr. Isabel Drooling from Sydney. She works with, um, I, she comes to Melbourne every month with Dr. Mahoney, Derek Mahoney, and I send them quite a lot of my sleep apnea adult patients who want to do expansion to open their airway. <clears throat> and uh, this is one of my patients who had sleep apnea and TMD and also wanted orthodontics. So what we did with him was I made him a splint to first help with his TMJ problems and pain. And we were using that for a few months until he was pain free. And then he started doing the palatal expansion. So he had a different expander device. It's still screwed inside his palate by using a different high, um, a different super screw instead of the Hyrax screw. And he's just turning that gradually over the last few months to expand that palate. Um, and we're used, still using a splint on the bottom and just help with his TMD while we're doing the palatal expansion. But I can see how much we're not expand. We're not trying to. It does. We're not trying to move the teeth in this situation. We're trying to widen and expand that palatal um, base to help widen and expand the nose and the breathing. And you can see this expansion. The teeth do move, but it's not causing huge diastemas or big gaps or anything because we're looking at um, palatal remodeling, not dental, not just dental alveolar modeling or expansion. But the expansion is all happening here, where it's the most important part. So the nose is so important for us. As I was saying before, the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose, and the, the vomer and ethmoid bone is what makes up this um, midline suit, this palatal suit, uh, not palatal, this um, uh, nasal septum. And that's why it can become crooked and um, deviated. If the nose is too small, these bones will just kink off to the side to try fit inside the nose. Just sim same thing we see in the mouth with crooked teeth and the cilla. As I said, we can also have these enlarged turbinates, which can block the nose. And we can see turbinates on when we do our x-rays. So this is a CBCT, where you can see the septum is deviated and the turbinates are also inflamed. 
you don't have to do a CBCT. One of the basic orthodontic records we do is um, a frontal PA ceph. You still can see a deviated septum or enlarged turbinates or a frontal PA. So if you're doing orthodontics in kids and you're doing that frontal PA ceph, it only takes a few seconds to just look at that nose at the same time and see, oh, is there a breathing problem or obstruction in that nose? We can have a nasal valve collapse. So this is why my patients, whenever he breathes in, his nose just keeps collapsing. So it's no wonder he's going to have breathing and snoring problems with that. And the Malampay score is one of the most important scoring systems we use to help um, determine, um, look at sleep apnea. So it's very simple. Where we look inside the mouth, all we have to do is stick their tongue out and see if we can see down the back of the throat. So this person will be a Malampay 3, borderline 4. But the large... Um, the, small, the lower the Malampay score, the lower risk they have of having sleep apnea because their airway is larger. We could see tonsils. So um, just like I showed that earlier example, we could see larger structured tonsils. These tonsils are not infected. They don't need to be infected to be enlarged. It could just be too large and not infected. But this is a breathing and a airway, um, breathing obstruction and an airway problem. So it's something that needs to be fixed and addressed. This is that patient I showed before. Here's a sleep study. The number of times you stop breathing an hour was 80 times an hour. We want this to be below five. So it's no wonder he's having sleep apnea and got this tongue thrust and open bite. The tonsils just need to get out of there to help him breathe better. And this is where the tonsils sit at the back of the throat. We can also have adenoids. So adenoids are the tonsils of the nose and they normally sit behind, um, the, behind the nose. So we can't see them clinically, but Again, we do these beautiful, simple x-rays called lateral cephs for all of our kids when we're doing um, orthodontics. And it's, you can easily see large adenoids on a lateral ceph. Or if you do a CBCT, that much easier to see large adenoids behind the, um, behind the nasal airway. So here's an example of a lateral ceph. See, there's no this red area is where the adenoids would be. And there's no adenoids here, but you can see they're getting a bit larger and a bit larger here. So very simple to see there's some sort of blockage going on. Um, and you can see this guy's got a, um, an over, open bite, dolicofacial, his mandible is dropping backwards. He's definitely got mouth breathing problems and I don't even need to see his face to be able to tell that. So the reason why the adenoids also could be a problem is they can block the eustachian tube. And this is when we can see kids who are always having ear problems or ear aches or um, ear infections or grommets in their ears. So um, the eustachian tube can get blocked. And when the eustachian tube gets blocked, um, these kids will always have ear infections. Now, when we get older as adults, the eustachian tube starts dropping. Um, so it becomes easier to drain. So most of the time, kids it will be kids who have get frequent ear infections, but adults won't get as much because it's much easier to drain this, this eustachian tube. But the adenoids sit right here and they can block the eustachian tube as well. So I've seen kids who've had three or four different grommet surgeries to drain out their, um, their ears. And I've seen some kids who've gone deaf by eight years old because of how many times they have to do the grommet surgery. And the ENT um, never saw to look into the adenoids or remove them or uh, ask if the patient was having tonsillitis or adenoid issues all this time. So these are things we can easily look out for, uh, especially if the kids are telling us they've got ear problems, we see malocclusion, the mouth breathing, got a tongue tie. You just fill, um, fit, all these, um, fit all these pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. So this is the grommet surgery I was talking about. This is the eardrum. Basically, what they do is they put this little grommet um, drainage tube to help drain out fluid so the, um, they won't get infected and can help him hear better as well. So with the tongue, um, oh, I showed the mountain pay score already. Uh, but we've got the scalloping of the tongue, as I mentioned before. This is a sign of tongue thrusting. It's also a sign of bruxism because they're trying to open their airway so they can breathe better. And the tongue's going to just push against their teeth to help them breathe. We could see xerostomia or a coated tongue where um, these are the patients are always getting candida or thrush and a bad breath or taste in the morning. And these open bites, that's, this is that uh, female I showed before. And we could also see um, head posture issues. So if we breathe through the nose, it's, we'll normally have a more upright head posture. But if we're a mouth breather, we'll normally push our head more forward to open the airway so it can breathe better. You can just try it at home. Just push your head back and try to breathe through your mouth. It's a lot harder, but if you push your head forward, 
It's a lot easier to breathe through your mouth when your head's more forward. And these are the TMD patients I see. They'll be ones coming with headaches and migraines and jaw pain because when you push your head more forward, we start overworking these super hyoid muscles and start compressing the TMJ and the condyle more. So mouth breathing can cause snoring sleep apnea, which can then cause forward head posture and more compression of the TMJ and start causing TMD and head and jaw pain. If they're clenching and grinding, that's just gonna, gonna exacerbate the pain even further. And you can just see that whole domino cascade effect going on just from mouth breathing. So these are a few examples of some CBCTs of mine. Uh, so this is one of my patients got a very big airway um, and we can do volumetric analysis with some CBCTs and we can use it to see how large or small the airway is. So this scale here, normally blue and white is big. So you can see this person all red at the back of the throat here. So very small, narrow airway. And this is a kid I saw years ago in Darwin, um, open bite, malocclusion, um, cross bite, narrow maxilla. We do a CBCT, look at that, large adenoids, sinuses are completely blocked, nose are completely blocked, and she's like 11 years old. And you know, you can imagine, yes, I'm going to do brace on her, but if I didn't look at her breathing issues or her adenoids, she's probably going to keep having an open bite. If I do brace and close this up, she's going to keep tongue thrusting and open the bite again. Even with retainers, she's probably going to open this bite because we haven't addressed the cause of her malocclusion and potential sleep apnea. And it's another of my patients, um, another kid, uh, eight years old, I think, narrow maxilla, bit of a crossbite, um, crowding. Mountain pay is not too bad. Again, when we do a CBCT, nose and sinus is completely blocked up. And she's eight years old. So she was someone we sent straight away to ENT to clear up her sinuses. Because eight years old with this, these sort of sinuses, that is not normal. At, and you can imagine, she's got her 90 years left of her life. We don't want her to be having breathing problems at this young age. So in terms of how we manage sleep apnea, there's a few different ways. Um, we always look in conservative management, like weight loss, exercise, et cetera. But we've got CPAP, um, oral appliances, such as mass, and then surgery. And the new things that we're looking into these days are orthodontics and myofunctional therapy. And you can see our mass may not fit everything. So we only fall into here as dentists with MADs, mandibular advancement at management devices. But there's lots of other possible treatments and causes out there which can be related with sleep apnea. So we have to also remember we're only part of the solution and don't get so stuck into our little bubble of dentistry that, yeah, I'm a sleep dentist, but we also have to remember this is a health problem. And we have to look into other issues and treatments that we have available. So my functional therapy is something I've been using a lot more in my in the um, in the last few years for sleep apnea because the research does show it can decrease the AHI by to fifty or sixty percent in adults and kids. The tricky thing with my functional exercise is it does involve compliance, and um, especially with adults, it's sometimes hard to do get comp good compliance with adults. But it is very effective, um, and uh, this other research shows that graded my functional exercises does um, increases um, the compliance and can reduce the severity of sleep apnea, especially if we're using mandibular advanced splints, which aren't fixing everything. So with mandibular advancement splints, um, what, how they work basically is advancing the mandible. And obviously when we advance the mandible, it's gonna help open this um, pharyngeal airway at the back so they can breathe better and just get more air down into their lungs. Um, and here's another um, example, uh, another article showing that how they work. Um, it also, they can also increase the genoglossus muscle, um, tongue muscle activity to tone up the tongue to keep that airway open. So with all sort of um, the, that, one of the things we need to note though when we're making mandibular advance and splints is they can cause bite changes. And unfortunately, there's no way to avoid it. Um, it is some, I some, warn all my patients, they could have occlusal changes. And unfortunately, we don't know when. Some people will never get changes. Some people may, may get changes in a few years or 20 years later, or some may get it in a few months. And it's something I warn all my patients because it can happen. This is one of my patients who came to see me. I, this is the first day I saw him. He got one of these over-the-counter splints, uh, mandibular advantage splints, and it was helping his snoring. Uh, but 
he had this posterior open bite and he didn't even know he had a posterior open bite until I told him about it. And I called his dentist. His dentist said, no, he never had a posterior open bite until he started using this. So you can see the bite changes can be quite rapid. So we have to be careful when we use these splints and know how to make sure it doesn't cause bite changes or reduce them. And also warn our patient about these potential side effects. Uh, but this patient, I'm now treating him with a proper mass and he's still got this bite change, but He's perfectly fine. He's, he can eat and talk fine, even with his back teeth not touching. He never noticed this until I told him. So he doesn't mind about the bite change. There's another example of one of my patients where you can see we're using a different splint where we're pushing, holding the mandible forward. And with this sort of monoblock design, I just, um, it's, I normally use this in TMD patients because it's more of an anterior deprogramming effect to help take pressure off the temporalis and master muscles. I just put this little acrylic at the back to try push the mandible forward. There's another of my patients where we use um, this other mass, um, the more traditional mass with the arms to help push and hold it forward. And you can see the different designs here. This is the same patient. He had this um, old acrylic mass, and I, I like you, I've been using these um, 3D printed nylon masses, which are a lot thinner. And you can just see how much more uh, less space they take in the mouth because they'll just create more room for the tongue so it won't block the airway as much. And here's just another example showing this um, other mass. Same, works all the same, but just a um, thicker material, more uncomfortable to use. So we can use these smaller, thinner 3D printed devices, which don't take as much space and a lot more comfortable. And you can see how we don't have to use as much vertical as well. So it's less chance causing TMD problems while we're um, using these appliances. This is another design where um, it's using elastic straps to help hold the mandible forward, to keep it airway open. So uh, basically just like using a twin block or functional appliance in um, kids. So I'll finish things off by just going through two cases of mine with uh, which I've been treating with sleep apnea. So this is a 58 year old um, physiotherapist who had severe sleep apnea and she couldn't use CPAPs and she clenched and grinded her teeth. So she wanted to use a mask. So, this is her mouth, um, not that bad inside the mouth. Um, and she, uh, you can see she, her um, bit of an overbite. Um, and uh, I, I would say that um, her mandible is trapped backwards because of how um, nine, how inclined these incisors are. So if they were more um, proclined where they normally should be, it will allow her mandible to come a bit more forward. Uh, mountain pay score is four. I made one of these 3D printed nylon masses. And how you adjust them is you just um, take these little tabs out. You can change different sizes to gradually push her jaw forward. Now, because she's severe sleep apnea, sometimes we can't fix severe sleep apnea with a mass. And, but she didn't want to use CPAP. So we made the mass for her. And on the number zero first titration, she started getting headaches from the mass because it was too, um, there was too much vertical for it. So I had to reduce the vertical a bit to help um, relieve the headaches. Um, then in a two month review, she could now use a properly a number zero, but when she pushed it more forward, she started getting headaches again. So on the num number one setting, she was starting to get headaches from her, from her back and from her neck. Um, so I reduced the, the vertical further, um, but she hadn't been feeling any change to her sleep quality or OSA yet. Then on the three month review, um, she can now titrate her mandible a lot more now and with no headaches or migraines. She's gone to number three setting. She could go further to like number six, but she's still not feeling any change of sleep quality. And um, she started using CPAP. She's just like, nah, I can't deal with it. Um, I'm feeling too tired. I think I'll have to use CPAP. She's using CPAP. She's feeling better, but she hates using it. She still wants to be able to try use a mass um, and get it to work for her. So I sent it to my colleague, Dr. Donnie in Melbourne, who does my oral myofunctional therapy. And now we're treating her by doing tongue and lip exercises while using her mass. And he's been and Donnie has been teaching her um, different tongue and lip exercises like TikTok and humming. And these are simple exercises to help train the tongue to stand up to the roof of the mouth. And when we're doing these exercises, like the TikTok is just going like, and humming is just going, mm, just like that. And these exercises are so simple, but this patient couldn't even do these exercises. She had very poor tongue t muscle tone and control of her tongue. So it just showed us that, yep, we could use CPAP, we could use mass, but if her tongue is still too weak, it's also got to cause sleep apnea. And being a physio, she was so fascinated about how the muscles work. And she's been seeing Donnie now for about a month. So she's still going pretty well for treatment, getting more strength in her tongue now. She's starting to notice a few changes with her breathing. 
Uh, this is another case of mine. He came into me for bruxism. 31-year-old male, um, no pain or TMD. His main concern is weighing down his teeth from bruxism. Now, he also noticed that his bite has been changing since he inv finished Invisalign in 2019. And he's thinking his bruxism or his splint is causing the bite changes. So he's been having very severe tooth wear and breaking all his Essex retainers every few months. And he just wants to stop wasting money and find the cause of his clenching and grinding. So he had photos from before his Invisalign. So this is his mouth. You can see a bit of a narrow, tapered maxilla, overjet, and you can see he's got an open bite. So I'm really thinking, hmm, why is causing his open bite? We look inside um, post Invisalign. So I was sort of thinking, what happened with the Invisalign? Uh, they didn't really do much. Still had an open bite. Um, but this is um, a few different photos he showed me post Invisalign as well. So the bite got a bit more closed here. I think they did some refinement after. The, this um, between these two photos, um, and the man actually closed the bite a bit. Uh, but then this is where I saw him just a few weeks ago. You see, bite has opened even further beyond where it was before he even started Invisalign. And you could see this is his splint. It's a exclusive splint covering all his teeth. He's had this open bite for a while because he made a splint like a year ago. So the splint is doesn't, isn't causing the open bite. His tongue thrusting is causing an open bite. And the open bite is worse than it was before the Invisalign. And this patient, he snores at night. Uh, so no one ever asked if he snores. And he's come to me as a clencher grinder. So we can look down his airway. He's got a Malin Pay 4. We know he snores. We know his grinds. He's just ticking all the boxes telling us that he's potentially got sleep apnea. He's got a bit of a tongue tie as well when we look at it. So we'd say he's got a grade 3 um, functional tongue tie. I did a CBCT to check his TMJs um, just to make sure they were okay because of his bruxism. TMJ condyles are all fine. But we can look at his uh, lateral self airway, soft palate, um, pharyngeal airway is very small and narrow. When we measure it, it, um, it cuts off over here, but you can see very small and narrow in the back of his throat and airway. And we could also see his nose got a bit of a deviated septum and his turbinates are inflamed. So I'm still waiting for his sleep style results. Uh, once we get his sleep style results, we're going to start making a plan to see what we can do for his sleep apnea. And most likely, I'm thinking we need to send him to ENT to work with his nose, possibly work with his uh, tongue tie and tongue thrusting because I can make him a mass and help with his bruxism and sleep apnea. But if he's still tongue thrusting, his mouth could still open more. He could still develop more for open bite. And he could, um, the tongue thrusting could still, the tongue tie and everything could still cause sleep apnea even with a mass. So that's basically where I am with his treatment at the moment. So thank you all for your time tonight. Um, if you, I will be doing another lecture in a few weeks on bruxism. And feel free to um, reach out to me if you have any questions or cases you ever want to chat about. All right. So let's, uh, yeah. Hello again. <laughs> All right, so let's go through a few Q and A. Uh, let me see. <clears throat> okay. Oh, um, sorry, Alex. I don't think I can hear you. I think you're muted. Mm. <laughs> Oh, hang on. Um, I can't hear you still, Alex. Um, uh, is it because I'm still sharing? Can you hear oh, me? Yeah. Yep. Now I can hear. You. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> All good. When you start when you start adding in microphones, you kind of you start creating more problems for yourself. But anyway, yeah, I know. <laughs> really, really great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks, Alex. We'll get some more questions rolling through. One of the questions I had you you started off with pediatrics. Mm. In in that phase, I think one of the questions was something that we hear a lot about. You know, we understand the um, you know the issues and the considerations of sleep apnea in children. Is there studies that reflect you know? how quickly and what percentage of children grow out of this if no treatment was done? Um, mm. So you there... say they've got sleep apnea um, or snoring and they don't have any treatment. And is there any research which shows that they grow out of it? Yes. From what I know, I don't think there is any research on it um, that has looked into that because 
in my opinion, uh, if they if they were doing research which showed a kid had snort had sleep apnea, mm. I reckon they would probably treat it. I don't think they would just leave it and wait for him to get older and see if it gets better. Um, and would de- yeah. Mm. So I don't know Abs- any research, but from what I know, it probably won't get better as they get older unless potentially their jaws are growing wider. Mm. So I guess that's what I'm referring to in terms of, and perhaps um, not no treatment, but perhaps um, purely conservative management as opposed to, um, you know, in cases where children have, uh, you know, adenoids or tonsils that are um, oversized. You know, we know anatomically that, you know, as we grow, the airway should expand and, you know, relative mm. to that, those, those should uh, decrease. Because there is mm. literature that I have read where long term there's now a concern amongst ENTs. You know, if we remove adenoids and tonsils, um, perhaps too proactively, you know, we are perhaps putting that patient under a high risk of, um, you know, or also uh, oral pharyngeal mm. cancers in the future. Is that something you've come across? Or yes, it is, and it's actually a very good point you bring up. So. Um, yeah, the tonsils and adenoids they do shrink as we get older. So there is that in those circumstances, potentially um, the sleep apnea could get better over time. Though we're looking at um, roughly eight or nine years old when they start shrinking. If the kid has mm. is like three years old with those yeah. large adenoids or tonsils, that's quite a long time to wait. But the other thing as well, um, Audrey, Dr. Audrey Yoon, that orthodontist I showed earlier, she's been doing lots of research into um, maxillary expansion and doing that with kids to help treat sleep apnea. And she's found that by um, doing maxillary expansion and reversing mouth breathing to nasal breathing, she's seen large tonsil adenoids shrink naturally by themselves mm-hmm. after, do- after the kid reverts from mouth breathing to nose breathing. Um, and she believes it's because they're no longer breathing through the mouth, which is very inflammatory. Um, Mm -hmm. And when we breathe through the mouth, um, since the mouth doesn't filter out all the bacteria we breathe in, it just inflames the tonsils and makes them larger um, and can also have a cascade effect onto the adenoids as well. So it's very interesting research that by just um, doing expansion and encouraging nasal breathing again, the tonsil adenoids just shrink naturally by themselves a lot faster. And she's seeing these changes within a few months, not waiting years for them to shrink. Mm -hmm. She's starting to see them shrink during the expansion process. Yeah. Mm. No, very interesting. Um, and Manuel's asked question. He's asked, um, in, do you prescribe any deprogramming or reprogram device in the mornings after a patient takes out their mass, perhaps early or those who are new to it, perhaps those who are kind of been in the treatment phase uh, for a while? Mm, yeah. So all my um, mandibular advancement splint patients, um, I always give them a reprogramming or deep um, device to use in the morning. Not all of them use it. I always tell them, start using it if you feel the bite is changing. So um, if they wake up every morning feeling the bite is all fine, then they don't need to use it. Some people, the bite might just take maybe 10, 15 minutes to go back to normal by itself. Some people, it takes a few hours and they tell me this, the bite is still feeling different around lunchtime. So those are the ones who are normally using it every morning um, for about 10, 15 minutes to just help um, reposition the mandible back. And, you, do uh, you have a since, oh, yes. favorite tool in that regard? or uh, Yeah, it's this. Um, actually, I can give it a I've got one. This is like a, a periodontist with picksters and interdental brush. You, <laughs> yeah. you just have them lying around just in case. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, um, yeah, this is a um, little thing. Like, it's a little um, silicon sort of wafer. Um, there was, mm. um, I buy it from this um, lab in, um, in Melbourne's dental lab called uh, 3D Sleep, um, r- run by Harry Ball. Um, mm-hmm. So this was, um, it's from this thing called the tap aligner. The tap aligner was from, um, it's some American product, which they use for sleep apnea. And they made these little thing. I can't remember what these wafer things were for, but it's just like um, silicon, which you bite into it. And I just basically Got use it. this, I heat it in hot water, get the patient to bite into um, MIC, mass, um, um, maximal intercuspation into it. So it just takes more of their bite. Then every morning I just get them to, bite into this about five minutes in the morning into that maximum intercuspation again. Yeah. And they're, okay. yeah, they're very affordable. These are like, I think they're like um, five 
or dollars or so from 3D Sleep. So I just buy a bunch of them in bulk and just give it, um, give them to patients with their splints. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. That's really useful. For the dentists out there listening, um, in terms of sleep, in terms of, um, you know, in particular, not necessarily children, but in terms of adults, how, how have you found, now obviously you have a bias sample, you know, you've got patients who are, you know, understanding that they have something going on and um, they need to, or they're looking at addressing that. How do you recommend for a dentist, general practitioner, you know, you were there yourself not too long ago, um, seeing regular patients who, you know, you're asking these stop bank questions, you're identifying, you know, perhaps there is an airway obstruction and perhaps, you know, we need to do further investigation through a sleep study or, you know, seeing an ENT. What have you found to be the, um, best ways to clearly communicate the need for that um, and for patients to really understand, okay, just because, you know, as, as we do in dentistry all the time, you know, no pain doesn't mean no problem. Um, mm. what, what's been your experience? Yeah. So um, especially going, being in the general dental practice at the start, um, the big difference I saw when I went out of general dental practice was the acceptance and treatment <laughs> because they didn't see me as a dentist anymore. Um, whereas in the clinic, they would see a dental chair, see me in scrubs and things like that. So it was, um, you know, hard to sell the case um, or um, sell the reason um, because they just see it. Oh, it's just another thing product you're trying to sell me. So um, when with those general dental patients, especially if we've been doing lots of treatment already and they're feeling like I've finished all my feelings, I don't want to do more work. And then we tell them about sleep apnea, et cetera. Um, the, I found first you have to see how interested and motivated they are. And it can be tricky when the patients who the snoring doesn't bother them um, and they feel fresh in the morning. So I, I always um, um, gauge their interest first. I told them about how sleep apnea can affect them. Um, even if they're not feeling tired, I told them it can increase the risk of heart attack or stroke. Um, I told them that. Princess Leia from Star Wars, she, the actor, she passed away from sleep apnea. So that, sometimes that little pop culture sort of reference gets them interested as well. Uh, but if they're not interested, I'll just talk. I'll, I'll just bring up every time I see them. So every six months, they come in for a check and clean. I'll just bring up again. So, hey, how's that snoring and sleep issue going? Mm. Do you want to do anything about it? Or sometimes they'll bring it up to me. They'll say, oh, now it's bothering my wife or mm -hmm. I'm starting to notice I'm feeling more tired. And then they'll start bringing up that they want to do something. And it, it can suck when they don't want to do something because we yeah. always want, we're always wanting to help them. Um, but if they don't want to, it's just the same as if we tell them, you should do a root canal instead of exo on this tooth. And they said, no, nah, just pull it out. And we're like, oh, I don't want to. <laughs> the end of the day, the patient has their freedom of choice. So of I used to be very pushy at the start. like, no, you really have to do it. You have to do the sleep study, et cetera. And patients would just, you know, hate me sometimes. So I was like, it was just <laughs> <laughs> getting enough hate. Maybe it was, oh, I'll just choose the pet. Uh, the, the yeah, that's when I'll you go home and put on your favorite Star Wars movie. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> try and <laughs> yeah, I learn what Star Wars get into it and see Princess Leia. <laughs> Um, Rayel is asking, have you heard about issues with the dorsal style mass when moving up to tabs four, five, six with these tabs, is there, with these tabs in there, is there a larger gap between the fins and the upper buckle surfaces of the upper splint? Um, mm, yeah. does this allow for too much excessive lateral movement and flexing of the nylon? Mm, yeah. And, so and the, the, sorry to finish that. Would you recommend mm. remaking the mass at a higher titration? rather than moving beyond the third tab. Yeah, so um, I do see that sometimes, and that can even happen with the Somnomeds, where the Somnomeds, they used a, a screw to turn and sort of changing tabs. Um, so basically, they can have that, um, that thin slippage where... Um, I'm trying to think, where's my... It's lucky I have everything at home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so basically, because people... Pro probably won't know what um, Rao is talking about. Uh, we've got the splint here. And if we push it within a few, um, depending where the bite is, it, the more we push it, it can, it will, the more we push forward, the more forward it will go, obviously. But as it goes more forward, the, the front area is more tapered and thinner. So you can see the more forward we go, um, there's going to be more lateral movement. 
okay? Because the fins aren't thick enough anymore. And that's where if we're going to like, as Rao was asking, four, five, six, sometimes it's too, it's forward enough, but the patient can yeah. slip out um, of, the, um, of where it's being held with the fins. So um, in those situations, I, you might need to remake it. Um, and I normally tell the patients, if that's the case, um, I'll remake it. And I normally just charge them with the lab charges for a reset, which is about two, three hundred. Yeah. Um, but sometimes, most of the time, patients don't notice it, to be honest. <laughs> and if it's not bothering them or hurting them, because I've even seen them with somnomeds um, and but most patients are sleeping fine for it. So if it doesn't bother them and it's not causing any dental or jaw problems, you hmm. may not need to do anything. But if you do see it's causing problems um, or the, it's bothering the patient, that's when I'd say possibly re um, worth remaking it and doing a reset yeah. of the bite. Yeah. Yeah. On the, tr on the, on the train thought of the nylons, I know you're a proponent of it because, you know, the issue with a lot of the acrylics is the bulkiness of the appliances um, and the thickness is required we, with the nylon what, what's been your experience because what we know is you know your initial fit and occlusion and as you mentioned you know the vertical um, things occlusion changes over time um, mm. and there's wear of the device itself mm. how do you how do you compare the adjustment and concern for, I guess, longevity of the appliance, if there's too much adjustment required of it, like the nylon compared to the acrylic or mm. you know, vice versa. Yeah. So in terms of um, wear and tear of the appliances, um, even the acrylic ones, I have to say um, wear and tear on nylon or acrylic masses is very minimal because even their Bruxa, because it's um, nylon on nylon or acrylic mm. on acrylic, they don't really wear down that much because it's the two same um, hardness of materials. Whereas if it was uh, enamel against acrylic or enamel against nylon, they will wear down. So I normally find you won't see much wear and tear compared to like a Michigan splint. Um, in terms of with like a acrylic, som uh, acrylic mass, the main wear and tear or breaks you can see is the fins could break um, because when they grind laterally, for example, it can make the, um, the acrylic is brittle, so it can just snap off. Whereas with nylon, it's very strong. So I haven't really seen much breakage from it. The only main breakage I see from nylon would be um, cats and dogs, <laughs> or dogs mostly, um, because they can chew for it. In terms of um, longevity, now we see patients with acrylic splints. You've had them for like 30, 40 years, and they still have the same one, just a bit stained. And nylon, it, I haven't been using for I've seen um, with nylon splints <laughs> that long yet, but the... Um, this material is much stronger and more comfortable to use than acrylic. And so far, um, I haven't seen any major um, wear and tear or issues besides staining over time. So yeah. I would say the longevity is just as comparable as acrylic, probably better because there's less wear and tear or less risk of breaking the fins. Um, and in terms of like adjusting it, let's say people get fillings, etc. It'll be very similar to if they had a some uh, acrylic somnomed or acrylic michigan splint um depending how many teeth are done if it's a few teeth uh, like one or two teeth i've had patients who had fillings and i just had to adjust the mass to make it fit again mm. nylon you do need to use tungsten carbide burrs to adjust yeah. it so normal acrylic burrs won't adjust so the slow speed straight handpiece with a tungsten carbide um when you use it it's just like cutting for acrylic um and it, the adjustment process will just be the same you can't really add acrylic to nylon, um, so but it's very rare you would have to add acrylic. So um, and that's where getting the um, the most important part when you're ever making any splint, not just a mass, but any splint, is getting the bite correct from the start, yeah. um, because then it minimizes the adjustments, minimizes the chance of having to add acrylic for increasing and decreasing vertical, and even adding acrylic to acrylic splints, the acrylic tends to break off over time anyway. So getting the bite vertical and protrusion with a mass um, and knowing what position, would, um, what height and protrusion would be the best is the most important part at the start because then it's just going to minimize the amount of um, adjusting you'll need to do in the future. Wonderful. Last question. Yeah. Um, for patients who, you know, you've done your diagnosis, your consideration is for a mass appliance, what are the patient or oral risk factors which make you concerned of, you know, the success of the device 
you know, you've mentioned obviously the sleep, severe sleep apnea as kind of mm. one of those factors. Um, you've mentioned the thickness and TMD that could be, um, you know, a consequence uh, and mm. need to be monitored. You know, wh where, where do you, you know, when you assess a patient and, you know, the patient and, and orally, what are the risk factors that you suggest to you, you know, what, you know, I'm going to have to proceed with caution. I might have to do more reviews. I may have to um, mm. you know, adjust what I would normally do. Mm. So um, the occlusion first, so whether class one, two or three occlusion. So obviously the class two occlusions, deep bites, they're the easiest to, to treat. If they're class one or class threes, which are not that common, class threes, but obviously they're going to have less chance of uh, less protrusion available. Um, yeah. And I would combine that with their severe, severity of apnea. So let's say it's a class one patient and their OSA is like um, seven times an hour. I'd say, oh, that's not too, that's pretty mild. And you've a class one, we don't, we may need to protrude too much. Let's say it's a class one with 30 times an hour. I said, I mean, we might probably have to bring it quite far forward. And my concern mm -hmm. with those, um, those class one or class three patients would be um, the higher risk of bite changes compared to a class two patient. And a class yeah. two patient would still have bite change, but it's more of a preferable bite change because they're getting from like a class yeah. two to a class one. And normally they don't notice it or they actually want the bite change. Uh, yeah. Whereas with class one or class three patients, they don't want it. So I'm always warning them from the very start, even more than other patients that there's a high risk of bite changes in you. Um, and we're going to have to accept that you might have it for the rest of your life. Um, the other things will be the size of, and shape of the maxilla. So if the maxilla is very small, or the, even the mandible, if the maxilla is very small, if the tongue is very large, and I'm putting more things in their mouth, even with um, even with a uh, nylon split, it still could be too much for uh, things in their mm -hmm. mouth. And even if they're uh, mild apnea with 10 per hour or seven an hour, the mouth just might be too small to even handle having more things in the mouth and they may not have much improvement. So um, that's why I always, I, I always take photos and show them to my patients so then they can see these problems at mm -hmm. all these like um, sort of obstacles which could happen. So if things don't work, um, they won't feel bad that, oh shit, I just paid two and a half grand for this and it doesn't work. <laughs> um, yeah. So at least they know from the start that why yeah. it may not have worked and what I'm only part of the problem or uh, part of the solution for their problem. Mm. <laughs> Definitely not part of the problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, don't I don't want to be part of their problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, one, one question. I think this is a nice one to start off. Um, Emmanuel is yeah. asking, how regularly do you review and adjust patients' mass so you've, you know, fitted, um, mm. happy, you've given them yep. advice, you've given them information about the titration that you're looking to do, Obviously, probably those who have greater titers, you might review mm. perhaps sooner. Um, but mm. in general, what is your review protocol? Yeah, so um, over the I with all my patient, mass patients for the first twelve months, I review them as many times as I need. So when I give them the mass, uh, then I normally bring it back a month later to check how they're doing. And the month I I don't bring back within one or two weeks because normally they're still getting used to it. They hate yeah. it. They complain to me about saliva and shit like that. So like nah. <laughs> I find four weeks minimum is a good enough time for them to because yeah. some take two or three weeks to get used to it. Yeah, yeah. Um and so I normally start with four weeks later. And then from that four week appointment, I'll see how they're going. And if they I feel they need to um they're still like you know not that going great with it. I'll tell them to come back in another four weeks um, because they may also be starting to push their jaw forward at this stage now. Mm -hmm. um, so they may not have titrated, done any titration in the first month. So I normally, mm -hmm. them, I normally do monthly for as long as I need. And then when I see they're getting used to it, they're feeling better, more refreshed, not complaining anymore. I then say, okay, let's do three months later, then six months later, then 12 months later. Um, and since uh, most people will be doing general dentistry and um, regular hygiene already, it will just be every six, 12, once they're in a stable state, just every 12, six months with their hygiene, just bring a splint in, check it at the same time. Whereas with me, when I'm not doing, since I don't do hygiene and all that, I told them to come back to me once a year. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Just even though they're seeing a dentist, I want to see as well every year just to check there's no bite changes or anything going on. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's basically how I do my, um, there's no there's no set standard, but that's how I like to do it just to keep on top of things, especially since there could be bite changes, which could pop up down the track. 
of course. Um, thank you so much for a wonderful webinar. Um, hope everyone's You're enjoyed welcome. this. Just wanted to let everyone know we have our Melbourne uh, Treatment Planning Study Club coming up in May. We've got a couple weeks left of early birds. Um, I'll post a link in the comments um, now. Um, this is going to be a really great Sunday brunch session. This is really just about bringing a lot of dentists together. We'll be talking about really interesting different types of cases um, from moderately complex rehabilitations to more complex and try to essentially expand everyone's horizons into you know, what are the treatment planning options? Um, you know, how do you work towards longevity, predictability, risk management, especially when you start looking at more and more complex cases. So um, hopefully everyone's able to join us there. Like I said, last next week or two, we've got left of early bird. Uh, so join us. Otherwise, have a lovely evening, everyone, and um, have a good night. Good night, everyone. Thanks a lot.